AI is evolving so fast today. If you're an AI model builder, you know how hard it is to keep track of all of the new tooling. From hugging phase to onslaught to axolotl, there seems to be a new library for training models every month. And while this progress in tooling is great because it takes care of a lot of the boilerplate code, the same main challenges remain when training an AI model. You still need to design, run, and interpret experiments in a very rigorous way for your models to improve. I've been training models for 10 years now, and I want to share some tips with you that are timeless and will hold regardless of how much the ecosystem changes. But before we start, a very quick note. Training is an overloaded term, especially as AI models and LLMs in particular become more complex. Training gets split into multiple stages, including pre-training, instruction fine-tuning, preference fine-tuning, task fine-tuning, and so on. These tips generally apply across all stages, but realistically, fewer of us will do pre-training and more of us will do task fine-tuning. If you'd like to see a code tutorial focused on task fine-tuning, let me know in the comment section below. All right, let's get started. My very first piece of advice is to start from evaluation. Obviously, if you can't measure progress, then there is no progress. And just having an evaluation set is not enough because a bad one can lead you to the wrong conclusions. Let me give you a very simple example. Say that you're an email provider and you're trying to classify spam versus not spam then a seemingly reasonable thing to do would be to put aside 1% of your data and say, I'm going to use this for testing. The problem is, most likely, 99% of those emails will be not spam. So even the dumbest classifier that always says not spam will have 99% accuracy, which is obviously very misleading. Now, I know that's a very blatant example, but there are actually more subtle failure cases as well. And surprisingly, one of them comes from Stanford. They published this benchmark that we've been using for years before figuring out that there's something really wrong with it. It's called the Stanford Natural Language Inference Dataset, and it consists of pairs of sentences, one premise and one hypothesis. And the task is to put every pair into one of three buckets, contradiction, entailment, and neutral. So a random model should achieve around 33% accuracy since there's three labels. However, we discovered at some point that if we only show the model the second sentence, it will score 67%. But that's very unexpected. You would think that in the absence of the first sentence, models would be just as good as random. So what happened there? Well, as usual, the problem were humans. When prompted to come up with contradictions, they would often use explicit negation, like he's happy versus he's not happy, as opposed to something more implicit like today's Monday and tomorrow's Wednesday. So the model started picking up on the fact that the mere presence of the word not in the second sentence means that it must be originating from a contradiction pair. That's why it achieved this high accuracy even in the absence of the first sentence. So if you're confident in your ability of building a good evaluation set, think again. I would suggest delegating as much of the evaluation pipeline as possible to someone else. And that means using a benchmark that was approved by the community that comes with evaluation metrics and ideally some code that you can run to evaluate your own outputs. The last thing you want to do is Write your own code only to discover that there was a tiny little bug. So all of the conclusions you draw after hours of experimentation were wrong. Now, if your use case is very non-conventional, maybe because you're working for a company, you might not find the perfect benchmark that exactly reflects your task. However, even in that case, I would still start with an existing evaluation set just until I get confidence in my setup, in my end-to-end -end pipeline, and then I will swap in my own evaluation set. Another piece of advice that I have is never start from scratch. Start from code that was authored by a reputable source like a Colab notebook from Hugging Face or a GitHub repo that accompanies a published paper. The reason is there are so many moving pieces that need to come together in just the right way to make fine tuning work. 
for LLMs in particular, there's tokenization, there's prompting templates, model architectures, optimizers, and all of these come with their own hyperparameters. And finding the right combination takes more than a human lifetime. You don't want to do that. Even if your goal is to implement something from scratch because you want to learn, I would still start from an end-to-end -end working pipeline and then just carve out the piece that you want to re-implement. It's very standard nowadays when fine-tuning an LLM to start from a collab or a Jupyter notebook that comes from Hugging Face, Unsloth, and so on. These notebooks are great at the beginning when you're setting up the pipeline because they allow you to quickly visualize the data, figure out how to call the transformers library, make sure that the tensor shapes align, and so on. However, at some point, they become more of a curse than a blessing because of the way they manage state. Let me show you how I wasted a lot of time just the other day. So I have a collab notebook that's trying to fine tune an LLM. And in cell number one, I'm defining the model. And in cell number two, I'm defining a trainer and kicking off training. When I do hyperparameter exploration, it's very tempting to just modify these values in place and then only run the second cell. The problem is the model doesn't get reinitialized, but instead it continues from where it left off in the previous run. And that's not what we want. We want to restart from the base model. And that can lead to very misleading experiments. Looking at my weights and biases dashboard, you can see two experiments here. One is the tainted one where I only ran the second cell. And then you see the fresh one where I ran both cells. What I wanted to point out is that the behavior of the two training runs is very different because they start from different kinds of checkpoints. And had I not realized by mistake, I would have just drawn the wrong conclusions about the hyperparameters. So in order to not make my mistake, I would recommend moving over as fast as possible from the Colab notebook into a simple Python script so that you can start fresh every time you kick off training. So far, I mostly just talked about the logistics, about how to be disciplined in building your workflow. But now I want to shift the conversation towards the real work, which is designing your experiments and interpreting the outcomes. When looking at the outcomes, the first metric you're going to look at is, of course, the training loss. And you want to make sure you interpret it correctly. So first of all, what's the training loss? It's the delta between what the model is doing and what it should be doing. So in aggregate, it should go down over time. However, only in aggregate and also not forever. Let me explain. Let's look at the training loss for one of my experiments. As you can see here, it kind of jiggles up and down. So it's not a smooth downward slope. And that's totally expected. The reason is every single value on this plot was computed on a different batch. So on a different small subset of the training data. That's what justifies the variance, the fact that we're not comparing apples to apples. As a side note, chances are your batch size is going to be small because as models get bigger, we get bottlenecked by RAM and we just can't afford to store big batch sizes into memory. And remember, to store a batch doesn't just mean storing the text, but also the activations or the neuron outputs that need to be computed for every single instance in the batch. So all that's to say, a lot of variance is expected, and you can only expect to see a downward slope in aggregate. What I find very helpful is the smoothing uh, feature, where you can see it helps you see the bigger picture. Now, if you are doing natural language processing and you think your life is hard because the loss doesn't have a clear trend, Here's a diffusion model that I trained a while ago, and I was extremely frustrated because the batch size that I could afford was two. So even though the model was clearly improving, because as you can see here, I'm getting decent images, there was no way to tell from the training loss. So if you see it going down, enjoy it. I also said that the training loss should not go down forever because if it reaches zero, it means we're perfectly able to reproduce our training data in other words, we've memorized it. And memorization itself is not that big of a problem. The real problem is the model will probably forget everything else. That's a phenomenon called catastrophic forgetting. In that case, all we've done is find a very inefficient way of storing data. 
Your data might take a few kilobytes or megabytes to store, but congrats, now you're using billions of parameters to store it instead. Okay, so the loss should go down, but not forever. Then what's the sweet spot? How low should it go? To answer this question, you'll need a validation set. That's 5 to 10% of your training data that you put aside, and you will not use it neither for updating your model parameters nor for measuring the quality of the model at the end of training. Its sole purpose is to track how well training is going. And it can do that because of two important properties. We're looking at a fine-tuning experiment where I plotted both the training loss and the validation loss. So here's the first property of the validation set that makes it a good tracker for how well training is going. Well, every single point on this plot is computed on the exact same validation set, that 5% of your data. So we are comparing apples to apples as opposed to what happens during training where every single point reflects a different batch. And because of that, you can expect to see the validation loss to be a lot smoother. The second important property of the validation set is that because we never train on it, it's detecting memorization. So when memorization happens, the training loss keeps going down. However, the validation loss will maybe flatten or even go up because we're performing worse on those data points that we haven't seen. I have another experiment here where overfitting happened. So you see that my training loss keeps going down, making me think that the model is actually improving. But the validation loss is capturing the fact that at some point, so much memorization happens that my validation loss ends up being worse than the model that I started with. So my fine tuning is completely trashing the base model. So to go back to the original question, how low should the training loss go? Well, you should probably stop when your validation loss stops improving. So somewhere around 500 and 1.5K in my case. Now that we covered how to interpret experiments, Let's talk about how to design and actually run them. The single most productive thing you can do is to only change one thing at a time. And I know you will fight it, and I know you will try to bundle a bunch of changes into the same experiment, but trust me, it will turn against you in the end. Remember my experiment that was overfitting? Well, there are a bunch of things I can do to avoid overfitting. I could lower their learning rate, increase the number of warm-up steps, increase the batch size, increase the number of accumulation steps, add dropout, and so on. Let's see what happens when I do all of these things at once. Well, these two experiments are just so hard to compare. Maybe the only thing I can say definitely is that the second experiment leads to a lower validation loss at some point but it still overfits, so I really don't know where to go from here. In contrast, let's look at two experiments where the difference is only one setting. So this one has learning rate 1e-4, and this one has learning rate 5e-4. Look how nicely we can compare them here. It's very clear that the lower learning rate leads to proper training, and the higher learning rate 5e-4 leads to overfitting. Now, changing one thing at a time doesn't necessarily mean running all of these experiments sequentially. In fact, most of these experiments were run in parallel. What I'm saying is, at the end of the training runs, you should be able to compare experiments that only differ in one setting. Sometimes I look at my training metrics and something just doesn't make sense. And the natural question is, do I have a deterministic bug in my code, like maybe an off by one error when shifting the labels? Or is it just a bad choice of hyperparameters? In order to differentiate between the two, I like to check boundary conditions. Let me explain what that means. When fighting overfitting, one of the things that I tried was to add dropout of 30%. That means 30% of my trainable weights are just zeroed out. And I was very surprised to see that the behavior of the two experiments, the one with dropout and the one without dropout, are very, very similar. So it made me wonder, maybe my dropout setting are just not getting applied. Maybe there's a bug somewhere in my code. To check if that's the case, I set dropout to 1. That means 100% of my weights should be zeroed out. And I was able to see that for dropout 1, the training loss stops improving, and more importantly, my gradients are all zero. 
So that gave me the confidence that, no, there's no bug in my code. It's just that dropout didn't solve overfitting. The last piece of advice that I have for you is to be patient because training never works on the very first run. Even the transformers, which are now the ubiquitous model architecture for both language and vision models, actually had a very slow start. At the beginning, we didn't know how to stabilize training, so it took us a while to find the right hyperparameters. And today, be skeptical of the many notebooks and tutorials that simply run inference on the fine-tuned model without proving that it actually improves on the base model. In order to achieve that, there's actually a lot of effort involved. That's all I had for this video. I hope that these breadcrumbs will help you become a better machine learning engineer, regardless of the libraries or frameworks that you're using. Let me know in the comment section below if you'd like to see a more hands-on tutorial on how to do task fine tuning and bonus points for suggesting interesting tasks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.